I'm going to present chapter three called Vectors. And like I said, I basically am just presenting um, cohort one's slides from the GitHub. Um, I did add this in though about the pre-quiz. So we had five questions in the pre-quiz and um, about atomic, what are the four common, common and then two rare types of atomic vectors, what are attributes and so on. And I just wanted to add this because um, I think I said in the first meeting, I've been using R for a long time, but I could not really answer these questions. <laughs> um, I had no idea rare types and my answer for tibbles versus data frames was wrong. So uh, it was very, I mean, I learned a lot. Okay, so here are the sections. Um, we're gonna go through atomic vectors, attributes, and then uh, special vectors or S3 atomic vectors, lists, data frames and tibbles, and then the null. I'm actually gonna talk about the null um, in the beginning as a side-by-side -side with um, NA, NA values. Okay. So we have two different types of vectors. We have the um, atomic vectors. Then we also will call a list a vector. And then there's also this null that kind of lives by itself out here. So in the uh, atomic vectors, we'll see on the next slide a little bit more about them, but basically each element is the same type and the same size. So each is length one and double, each is length one is integer, each is length one logical, each is length one in character. Where a list is, you can have, um, like we saw last time, you can have pointers to elements that are different sizes and or different types. Okay. So there's four primary types of these atomic vectors. There's logical, integer, double, and character or strings. So we kind of have this hierarchy in naming where as we go down, we get more specific. And as we go up, we get more generic. So we have, um, let's see. And then yeah, the two rare types, which I have, don't think I've really ever used well, I have used complex actually. There's raw and complex. The only time I've ever used complex is for like eigenvalue decomposition. That's pretty much the only place I've ever seen it. Um, raw is for encoding like bytes. Um, and then you can check the type with this type of command which I think it was discussed in the book a little bit because you can, there's also like is dot functions, um, but they are not as reliable as these, this type of, specifically when it comes to the numeric class or type, I should say. Okay. So there is, a special indicator in R for missingness, and it's the NA. NA can be of any type, so it can be an integer, character, logical. And then calculations involving NAs usually result in more NAs. And then uh, if you look in the book, there are a few exceptions to that rule. And you can test if you have an NA type with is that NA. So we're gonna compare that with the null Null is its own vector type and it has length zero and it cannot have any attributes and you test with null. Um, and then just one thing that's pretty important for on the next section is the NA, the default type is logical. So that's important for R's rules about coercion. Hopefully I'm not going too fast for anybody. Um, so co coercion, happens when you attempt to combine vectors with elements of different types. And there's a specific order that the types are coerced. And I actually put these arrows the opposite way that they're in the book makes more sense to me. So 
um, the four types, right? Character, double, integer, logical. If you try to combine two different types, whichever one is more on the right will get um, coerced into the type on the left. So that's made more sense to me on the arrows. So I kind of switched them. So we see here, we have maybe an integer and a double. So an integer is to the right, it will get coerced up to a double. And we see that happening in all of these cases. Um, so I, here I just have one that's mixed. We have an integer, logical, and character. Since character is the farthest to the left, everything will get coerced up to character. So that makes sense why NA's default is logical because hopefully then it will never like break your code. It will always just get coerced up to whatever type you're working with instead of your data getting coerced you know, down to a logical. You can also use the as dot function. So here we have an integer and a double, which based on the rules, we would have a vector of doubles but we can use this as that integer to force it to stay lower in the hierarchy. Um, sometimes you'll get NA. So here we're trying to turn a character A into an integer and uh, we, don't have a, we don't have a way to do that. So we, we get an NA out here. Okay. Okay, so that was the section on atomic vectors, feel free to interrupt at any point. Um, so here we're gonna talk about, about attributes. So attributes can be described as name value pairs of metadata for our objects. You can set or get attributes with this ATTR function. So here we have um, a vector X and we're gonna set an attribute with the name what to the value apple. So this is our setting step, and then this is our getting step. We're gonna get the attribute what from X and print it out. It has the value apple. So you can see that we never actually see what X is. We just are seeing this attribute what. Um, you can use attributes or structure to get and set multiple attributes. So here we have, we named arguments. So we're gonna have the attribute what is apple and the attribute type is fruit. And then we're getting the attributes here. Okay, and so with the exception of two special attributes, names and dim, um, most attributes will be lost with calculations. So here we're subsetting X to the first element and we see we lost all of our attributes. We lost what and type. Okay, so names is a, a special attribute that in R and you can assign it in multiple ways. And we saw, I included this little bit from last week where we saw we could have an emoji as a name so here are three different ways to set names of a vector. So you can have a um, sort of, you have your name equals, and then this will be the element in the vectors. And then, or you can assign the your vector first and then use the names function. This is usually what I do, number two. Um, or there's also this set names function. And they all have the same output. Okay, dimension tells us the dimension of our vector. So we can turn a 1D vector into a 2D matrix or an ND array. And so here, matrix kind of has this special format where you put in your elements, then you say how many rows and columns you would like. Um, you don't have to specify both. I'm not sure. I think you only have to specify one, but yeah. I, I never thought about that before. What would happen if you didn't specify either of them? I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'm getting sidetracked. And then we can also use array where you would say the, the dim as um, a vector of dimension. So we're gonna have one, um, three and two. 
a one by three by two array. And then that's B here, sorry. Okay, so technically a 1D vector without a dim attribute has null dimensions. So most of the time, like this one to six by itself, it wouldn't have any dimensions. Um, and, but matrices and arrays can be a single column or row vector. So this is important if you're doing a lot of subsetting. If you, when you're done subsetting, if you only have one row or one column, it may lose its dimension attribute unless you can add drop equals false in the subsetting. And then it'll keep um, that dimension. So if you need to do matrix multiplication, it, it'll work out the way you want it to work out. Okay, so an S3 atomic vector. So objects with the class attribute, making them S3 objects. So there are four important S3 vector types. There's factor, date, this POSIX, CT, and then duration. And these are, so factor is of built on integer, and then our time their, uh, classes are built on double. So, I'm just gonna go through each of these a little bit more. Um, yeah, I don't have much more to say on this. The class, depending on what class, sometimes the functions that such as print um, will behave differently depending on what class your object is. Okay, so a factor class is a vector that can only contain predefined values. And it has two attributes, the class, which is factor, and then the levels. So it's built on top of integers, not characters. So we can have this factor fruits, banana, apple, carrot. If we um, show fruits, we have these three levels, apple, banana, and carrot. Um, if you actually, fruits here, it's being printed as the labels, but it's built on top of integers. so. Apple would correspond to a one, banana a two, and carrot a three. Um, and so a factor generally has no, doesn't know anything about order. Default is alphabetical order. If you have a specific order you want to use, you can use this ordered function. And then your factor will have explicit ordering in the levels. Um, and so you, you put the order you want here, one, two, and three. You can also change these um, order up here if you want, you know, sometimes if you're making plots, you want to change the order of your levels so that it prints in a logical way that might not be alphabetical. Okay. So now we have date, this POSIX, CT, and duration. They're all built on top of doubles, right? Because you can have, you know, fractions of time. So it makes sense that they're built on doubles. Dates have this class date. Um, and they are actually represent seconds since this January 1, 1970. So if you um, coerce maybe date to be numeric, um, it'll be these seconds since 1970. There's also other types of this POSIX. So it depends on how you want it printed. CT is, I think, calendar and then local time. And they're part of this parent class POSIX T. And then they have this uh, that time zone attribute as well. Durations have two attributes, their class diff time and then the units of the um, difference. So for example, day, I don't think you can have every possible unit. I don't think you can have, um, I just did this recently. I don't think you can have months actually, but Luberdate package, if you guys use that, um, makes this stuff a lot easier. Okay, the next section is on lists. So a list you can think of sort of in this recursive, 
framework, each element can be of any atomic type or even a list. So this is a example from the book of a list of a list of a list of um, just one, this numeric one value. And as we saw last time from Camillo's great intro to chapter two, that the sizes can be a little bit misleading because each um, element of the list is a pointer, just a pointer to an object. So even though we're gonna repeat X three times, we don't have three times the size here. Okay. And then here's a last little example. If you combine lists using the combine function C or the list function, you'll get different outputs. So um, if we have two lists, X and Y, and then we say list X and Y, we'll only have length two um, because we'll have sort of this nested list. If we use combine, then we'll have length four. So we'll just have a list that has A, B, C, and D at the same level of the list. This one would have A and B and C and D kind of one level lower. Um, will be nested. Okay, and then two uh, special type of list. Well, there's two special types of lists, data frame and tibble. So these are S3 vectors, uh, versions of lists. So they'll have the class attribute associated with them. So a data frame, right, is a special type of list where um, each element has to be the same length, essentially. So each element of, your of our data frame here is length two but they are, can be different types. So that's how they differ from. Um, and we know that each of these is a pointer, whereas a matrix would be a, like a whole object. There's some differences between a data frame and a tibble. So this, I think, just changed. So before our version 4.0, if you had a character column in your data frame, it would automatically be converted to a factor. And so that is not very, um, it's not a good behavior for uh, maintaining your data and reproducibility. And so one way that tibble differed before 4.0 was they didn't have that default behavior. Um, in data frames, you can have row names. Tibbles discourage row names, which are generally bad. Some of the reasons they list for being bad is um, you're storing metadata in a different way than the rest of your data. It'll only work if a row can be identified by a single string and it must be unique. So say you do a repeated study, um, you might have the row name be, you know, maybe I'm in a study, it'll be torn, torn, torn every time I go get um, data collected on me, but it would have to be like torrent point one, torrent point two, um, where if you just have it in its own column, you can have the same name listed in the same way, multiple times. Uh, yeah, tibbles have prettier print methods. If you print them in the console, it'll have the type of each column listed under the column name and it'll kind of automatically fit it in your console window for you. They have stricter subsetting rules, meaning that they don't allow the partial matching if you subset with a dollar sign. In the data frame, they will partially match the value that you type to all the column names. So if you typed um, just the first letter, it'll return something that might have the same first letter. Okay, so you can have a data frame column that is a list, but again, it has to be the same length as your other columns. So here we can add a column Y that's a list of length two. That's a list of integer vectors. Here we have to use this wrap with this I function for identity. 
And then with tibbles, it's a little bit easier. You don't have to use the identity function. Here we, is an example of this maybe prettier printing where we have the type of our columns listed underneath. And we have the dimension attribute here as well. Okay. You can even have matrices as columns and you can, well, we know, right, data frames are a special lists, so we can even have a data frame that as a column. Again, right, we need the same. Um, here we have two rows, which matches the length of X. Here we have two, um, also have two rows. Or wait, let me think about this. No, A would be in the first row. And I actually don't know. I should run this. I didn't. Hmm. I think A would be in the first row and B would be in the second row. We should double check that. Okay, and then in review, this is on the um, Advanced R Companion Guide from the R for Data Science community. They kind of put together a more um, detailed sort of graph of what's going on. So we have um, three right types of vectors, null, atomic, and list. These dotted lines are supposed to represent what can be an element of a list. So a data frame can be an element of list, a list can be an element of a list, and a tibble can be an element of a list, and any vector can be an an element of a list. I'm not really sure why this one is dotted. I think that might be a mistake, but put it all together. <laughs> are there any questions? Hopefully that wasn't too fast. Did you end up running that data frame uh, thing from the last slide? It. Yeah, I was try. curious as to what would happen there. Okay, so it actually, let me share, maybe share this instead. Makes, yeah, this is a little weird. Let me start a new share. It actually makes y dot a and y dot b, which doesn't really seem like Maybe I need this. No. Oh. So I don't know. It doesn't. That's this to me doesn't really seem like the data frame is a column, if that makes sense. It just seems like it's making two columns. Yeah. With a table, though, it would actually make list items in there though wouldn't it let's see oops uh. <laughs> i'm messing this up life coding is always a challenge yeah <laughs> weird now this has like but this says but two, by two. two by two. Yeah. 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 Interesting. What is the dimensions on that data frame? Does it also say two by two or does it say something else? Oops. Ah, what is it? Oh. <laughs> two by three. Two by three. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. Well, thank you for presenting, Torin. But uh, I have actually got a question which goes right back to the first thing you were talking about, NAs and logical vectors. Mm -hmm. Do you know why the default missing value so the, the default NA is a logical vector. Why is it a logical vector and not 
um, an integer or a double or, or possibly a character. Yeah, so I think I mentioned that. I think I also mentioned it in the book. Basically, it's from the coercion rules. So the NA will be forced to be coerced rather than your data. So your data will remain unchanged, but the NA will get coerced to be the same. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, yes, you did mention that. Yeah, I get yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Does anyone here have a lot of experience um, using data frames versus tibbles and want to talk about when you would choose one over the other? That someone is not I had the same question. <laughs> I had the same question because I have never used tibbles before. I always, so. uh, when I import data, I always it always gets imported as data frames and I convert it into tables because on um, or I remember to install the table package afterwards because data frames are problematic and they tend to coerce things and all these factors, all the strings become factors and all the names of the columns become okay. scripted. I was importing something that had no syntactical names, as I was mentioning before, and they were changing the names and putting the same name like pam, 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 or, or something th similar. So at some point I start moving everything to tables because it was easier. I had more control of the data. I had unmodified the data. It, it was not doing anything as the data frames we're using. And that's about it. Require much less work when cleaning that. We clean the data, that's about it. I I'd certainly agree with Camilla on that. Yeah, uh, using tibbles, uh, it's a lot more intuitive than a data frame. And particularly um, what Torin was saying about printing, when you want to just have a quick look at what your data looks like, if you're using a large data set and you're using a data frame, you're going to get a mess in the console. And it's really, really handy to have a nice printing function for a tibble. I've also heard that tibbles are more memory efficient. Is that true? Perhaps we should find out. It's a more live coding. <laughs> Probably because they don't coerce things and they don't move anything. Any, any just get the data and they just put no syntactic with tactics and all that. Mm, but I haven't seen any any lots of difference. Uh, then again, my machines are bigger than my data just so far. So mm. I don't know. I yeah, I'm I work with tibbles only as a default because of uh, read underscore CSV. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that's a lot faster than read dot CSV. And so maybe the tibble being uh, not coercing things, being lazy as Hadley calls it, makes it faster mm -hmm. on the reading. Um, and I wonder if the only um, memory or speed benefit then is in the read-in as opposed to any processing with the subsequent tibble or data frame. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, someone doing some Googling to figure this out. I don't know about memory efficiency, but I know Tidy models and workflows now heavily relies on tibbles for including all of the different um, hyperparameters and the outcome models and the outcome like uh, what are they called uh, like performance measures for each of the models and I imagine they made that choice somewhat because of efficiency. I mean, it's also just being at our studio and Tibble's kind of underlying everything there. Um, but it's really useful when you have to keep, you've already got kind of two dimensional data and you're 
<clears throat> trying to attach complex objects like a workflow or a model object alongside, a, you know, like a, a row of a um, model performance measures like RMSC. So you have all of those things in one row and you can see all of your values that you, hyperparameters you used, all of your uh, performance measures. And then like in the last two columns, you have your model and the workflow used to build it. So you can keep like a lot of very different complex data all in like a two dimensional format. The other thing is that with the tables and our, oh, now that you mentioned the tables, the tidyverse, everything is consistent. and They are designed to work better one with the other. So many of those functions are specifically designed for tables. So you don't have to worry around trying to do or, or use base functions. You just put the, the functions, the bindings and the expansions and they will work. You don't have to do the translations of code. Hey, may I share my screen? Go for it. Can you see that? Okay, oh, uh, yeah, there you go. So this was just to answer the question about which is um, more memory efficient. Is it a tibble or is the same tibble but as a data frame? And if anyone wants to have a guess at which one is larger, um, for this case, you may be surprised. Because the object size of the tibble is 1,000 bytes, but the object size of the data frame is slightly smaller at 880 bytes, which is counter to what we thought. I don't know why that is. I don't know, maybe if we had um, millions screen? more rows of data, it might be something different. Do you have, do you have the structure right. of the two objects? Two by two, two by two. Is storing the same? I think tibbles, if you're looking at like small size data like that, tibbles store a couple more attributes on each column that describe each column. Like if you use dput on data frame and dput on the tibble, um, you can see all this kind of like extra attributes that it adds to each column. Um, Okay, so attributes for the tibble, names, row names. Oh, row names. Yeah, what? <laughs> Don't like that. And then attributes for the data frame. X, Y, X, Y, one, two, one, two. So it's got an extra you... two class attributes. Oh, it's basically the identification that is a tibble data frame and a, or a tibble. Ah, right, yeah, okay. So it's not actually the data which is causing the size increase mm -hmm. is the attributes. Okay. Well, if you look in that structure too, it lists the length of each of those columns where in the data frame it doesn't. So that might be what Steven was saying about there's more ah, attributes ah, yes. nested. Yeah, if you use dput, dput on the tibble, I think it, it shows like those things yeah, so you can so see. Like, what are you referring to specifically, Stephen? So it's got the structure and then the lists and then the row names like C, N, A, and negative 2L. It's weird how it represents them, but uh, and then class, tibble DF, tibble data frame. So that's how it constructs it. Excellent.
It was actually funny for me to read this chapter because I remember when Tibbles first kind of made it on the scene a couple years ago. And I thought that list columns were only part of Tibbles and that I was like scared of list columns. So I was like, I'm never gonna use Tibble. And then I learned in the book that a data frame can have a list column too. So I was so wrong. And I, I think um, using per, so per R, that package is quite, uh, it's a, the in thing to do at the moment, which requires a data frame, as you said, with uh, a list, a data frame of lists in order to run. Yeah, I use per a lot, but I don't frequently use list columns that much. There's even a, uh, I saw there's a parallelized version of per. Mm -hmm. It's called fur. <laughs> it's like for, you know, for each. So I think it's like, or it's like future. Future, future something. Yeah. 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 guess everyone is experts on vectors. <laughs> I just Googled per because um, I, when, I, when I'm using R, I just load the whole tidyverse. So I don't remember if I've mm. been using any specific per packages, but I forgot to add the extra R at the end. So oh. <laughs> I got the Google definition of per being a cat meow. Nice. Yeah, per the like flagship function is map. Yeah, that's what I would say, map. Map, and I think that's, in most cases, that's equivalent to, is it list apply? Lap yeah, it's like L apply. Well, apparently without the nasty side effects and more predictable. Well, it works with the, the tidyverse and everything that works with the tidyverse is predictable. So, yeah. I like that consistency. Yeah. 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 Does anyone here work a lot with um, another language besides R? I know that um, when I was learning Python, it's so different. Um, like how you think about your data in Python is very different from how you think about your data in R. I was just wondering if anyone had any perspective on that um, in the context of just this chapter. That's a really good question. Maybe we should just go around and say, like, if we have any experience in other languages. I have dabbled, yeah, in Python and MATLAB. And I took a class on SQL one time. <laughs> so I don't have any, yeah, like hands on experience with data analysis in other languages. It's been a while. I'm really working with some. Oh, sorry, Camilo. Go ahead. No, you go. You go. You go. Okay. So I'm currently working with some uh, databases, and they wanted me to use their like interface. Uh, I think what's it called? Uh, MySQL benchmark 
I was like, oh no, I'm just gonna use R. And so I created <laughs> a set of functions, and then I have a function that pulls the data as a data frame. But now I should pull to a table data. I will look into that. So I do everything with dplyr. Instead of typing uh, inner join or select from blah blah blah, I just do dplyr yeah. select yeah. dplyr filter, and it's just amazing. And I was showing my teammates, and they're like, oh wow, you can do that. Because they were like, how can I do this very complex query? Because they had to combine multiple tables. And I was like, you just bring that to R and that's it. And they were like, wow. Yeah, it was funny. <laughs> what was the um, program that the company wanted you to use as some variant of SQL? Oh, uh, no, it's MySQL, oh. but it's MySQL benchmark uh, or WordBench. I don't remember. I can I can look at it. Uh, Either way, I'm not familiar. Yeah, it's yeah my Good. SQL work. You don't you don't want to be familiar with SQL. <laughs> <laughs> you need to know enough to load it into R, load your data into R, and then that's it. <laughs> I've heard that yeah. it's it's when once you're working with big enough data though that it's significantly better than R for actually parsing through your data set. R has a huge problem, and is that the whole data set has to load in memory. Mm -hmm. So when you have things that are larger than memory, and I've, bought, I've, I've made um, Amazon machines that are 64 gigas, even so, they were too small for the data. So mm -hmm. I, had to, I had to launch SQL and do import some things. So... Another thing might be that you're working with a remote database and you probably don't want to pull all that data over the internet because mm -hmm. they imagine you pull the data, the entire database, just to filter your query. In my case, it works because it's, <laughs> it's, it's small. So, I mean, unless you have like ultra fast internet and like time that you don't really care and like lots of memory as well, like RAM, mm -hmm. then you're fine. And you're oh, not yeah. using mobile data. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the things that I don't like here. Mobile oh, data. Oh my goodness. Maybe that one. Yeah, look at that pumpkin hat. Oh yeah. But it's gonna eat so come on, come on, come on, come on. So the baby is one month old and doesn't do much SQL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It reminds you that um, good data in, good data out. So now he has, he needs good data. <laughs> Sorry for distracting you. <laughs> this is a welcome distraction. I remember i had a, a big not a big database it was only 50 gigas but it has to be done by sql because even the machines that i tried to rent were, were not enough to do that um at that point there were only 32 gigas now you can have 128 gigas but a friend was talking to me was telling me about his terabyte and and, and petabyte database so like you cannot work those in R, you probably can do some random something and things like that. And that's it. Yeah, this is a problem I'm running into a lot um, with work. I'm working on this big human microbiome project and we have like five terabytes of microbiome data plus mm -hmm. data from their medical chart plus all these questionnaires that they filled out at multiple time points. And I think I'm gonna have to use the SQL extension for R to actually do anything with this data. And I'm trying not to be afraid of that. <laughs> I don't think you should be afraid of SQL because. Uh, well, um, earlier you, you said you should. It. You said yeah, you should no. be very happy that you have, don't have experience. <laughs> <laughs> if you have the choice, then. I, su I would suggest R every time. However, 
I do appreciate that there's things that ours are cannot do. And if you are familiar with the tidyverse, it's mm-hmm. actually very similar to how SQL works. Because even a thing like something like a select in the tidyverse is actually it comes from I think it actually comes from select in MySQL. Mm. So the, 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 there's a lot of similar syntax and names between the two. I appreciate the reassurance. I'll keep you guys posted on how that goes. Um, yeah, I just don't want to. I just wanted to say hello to everyone. I am. Hello. <laughs> I am new. Hi, how are you? Very good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing very well. I just um, started attending last week. So I've just been kind of listening <laughs> and just seeing what you guys are talking about. Um, I, um, to answer the question from earlier, I primarily code in R, but I have done some Python and some MATLAB. And uh, my first language is Java but I haven't coded in Java in a very long time. So uh, yeah, I am, and I also use SQL some as well. I like to use Databricks. I don't know if you guys um, use that tool at all, but it allows me to use um, either Python or R or SQL all in one notebook. So it's, it's very, very cool. And I am hoping to be teaching uh, using that tool in the spring. So um, I wanted to just really brush up on my R and learn as much as I can before I need to start the course. So um, I am going to take a week um, to teach. I just need to catch up with you guys. So that's it. Just want to say hi. Hello. I'm so happy you joined. Welcome. I was going to ask a question when I was Googling about the data frame and tables. Does anyone use, um, what is it, data dot table? I think is another popular data manipulation framework in R. I've used it before, not much. It just depends on, okay, I'm just going to be honest here for a second. I, you know, if I'm trying to do a certain thing, I just Google it. And if, uh, <laughs> if they're using uh, data dot table, I you know I just I just borrow from it, and I don't really I haven't really noticed any difference between a data frame and data table. It seems very similar. The other thing is that I've seen that we are somehow logged into the tidyverse. Uh, huge amount of people depend on the data tidyverse. You uh, looking at resources, they'll point to this large corpora. Tidyverse and it's convenient. It's very nice. So I haven't seen it gets you locked in into that. So every time I install our first thing I install is Tidyverse. Install package is Tidyverse. And then I'll think about the others. I found a like a comparison of efficiency between data table, um, base R and dplyr. And I sent it to the chat so everyone can see it. And well, it seems that for some, for certain operations, um, data table seems to be slower. Um, well, for example, for filtering rows, it says that data table seems to be much faster than both base R and Deeply. So I guess at the end and like almost everything, the answer depends on your data or depends what you do with your data. Because there's no like an absolute truth, yeah. like, oh, this yeah. is the best thing ever, uh, magic, like this will solve everything. I mean, it will solve it, but there's probably something more efficient. And I guess that's one of the things I want to get into uh, using RCPP to do like, C with or C++ with R because I do a lot of parallel computing and I think that will be a game changer for me in 
to improve computing or I'm trying to get there. So step by step. <laughs> Why are you specifically interested in C plus plus then? Why not C you say, right? Well or yeah. So I guess because C plus was my very first programming language. So I That's guess impressive. I, <laughs> I'm just old, so <laughs> I guess when I had my first <laughs> introduction to computer science, that's what we had. Now they use Python, I think. And my professor used to say, oh, that's too easy. I don't want you make, to make your life easier. <laughs> so I remember we had something, uh, we deal with pointers. Oh, that was, a, that was painful in C++. Now I said, oh, you can do the job much easier. And I just do. Yeah. I guess just want to go back to my roots with C. But I have done C as well. So I could do C. We'll see. I have done assembly as well. But that's, an, that's another story. So I don't want to get there. Assembly programming. Hmm. Assembly is nice to learn about pointers. All right, so we are coming up on the hour. If anyone has any closing comments. Uh, just another thank you to Torin for presenting. And uh, thank you to Emily for turning up this week. Glad I could do so much for you. <laughs> and I've got also thanks to everybody for, uh, for turning up. Uh, it's a nice thing to do. Yeah, thank you for presenting. And thank you for hosting, Emily. Thank you for presenting, Torin. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about last week. Thanks for going with the flow. <laughs> thank you. That's sure. fun. <laughs> Next week is four, right? Chapter oh, four. who's four? Who's... Who is in charge of four? Oh, I think that is, uh, that's me, Alex. Okay. Exciting topic next week, subsetting. That's really cool. Yeah. We'll talk about, that is interesting. I'll make it interesting. Well, everyone stay safe. <laughs> yeah. See you next week. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Yeah, bye. Thanks. <laughs>